Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting for creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast for the stories. To do the work that we needed to do in understanding the threat better and building better analyses of it, including using the full suite of information out there to do so, in terms of engaging in prevention efforts, trying to stop people before they ever reach the stage of criminality or violence, in terms of dealing with those who do, and using even creatively, innovatively, the the tools in the toolbox of law enforcement, federal and otherwise, to disrupt activity when it reaches the point of criminality. And then over the long haul, to get at the, the contributors to this problem, that all of that needed to be done in a way that affirmed that core principle, which is that countering domestic terrorism is fundamentally about reaffirming a core principle of our democracy, that we resolve our differences, whatever they may be, peacefully and not through violence. I'm Scott R. Anderson, and this is the Lawfare Podcast for July 9th, 2021. For many Americans, the events of the past several years, for the 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, to the January 6th assault on the Capitol building, have driven home a disturbing conclusion. That the problems of extremism, violence, and terrorism are not just overseas phenomena, but have taken root here in the United States. One of President Biden's first actions upon assuming the presidency was to direct his staff to produce a strategy for addressing this challenge. 100 days later, they did so putting forward the first ever national strategy for countering domestic terrorism. To discuss this strategy, I sat down with White House official Joshua Geltzer, who is currently serving as a special advisor to the Homeland Security Advisor and oversaw the development of the national strategy. We talked about the logic behind it, the challenges and obstacles its authors encountered, and what it means for U.S. national security policy through the Biden administration and beyond. It's the Lawfare Podcast for July 9th. Joshua Geltzer on the national strategy for countering domestic terrorism. So, Josh, the Biden administration obviously came into office in a moment where it's hard to avoid these questions of domestic extremism, domestic terrorism. From Charlottesville in 2017 up until January 6th, it was this recurring theme in the background, at times intersecting with, in different, sometimes strange ways, different aspects of the Trump administration. And the Biden administration came into that context, particularly after the January 6th events, really I kind of at the at the front of people's minds. Tell us a little bit about this historical moment that we're living in, in regards to these issues, and how it's viewed by the Biden administration, something that I think this strategy really gets at with an interesting inclusion, which is this intelligent community assessment of these sorts of issues. What did that assessment find, and what is the the background we need to have about what the strategy is trying to address? I'm so glad you, you're, you're pointing to the historical context for this, Scott, because I really think it's it's important. Domestic terrorism in the United States both is longstanding and is new in some key ways. It's longstanding in the sense that it has been here and it especially has targeted particular communities for a long time. It was just a couple of weeks before the release of the national strategy that President Biden was in Tulsa, Oklahoma and called the race massacre there a set of acts of domestic terrorism, the first time uh, a sitting president had had done so. And I think that was a key message to send about the historical context in which we come to this work. At the same time, there are some very recent events that, of course, loom large for us as as we did this work. Uh, Those of us who had the opportunity to return to the White House on January 20 itself, and I was privileged to be among those. That was two weeks to the day after the events of January 6. The city of Washington, D.C. was almost unrecognizable in some ways to those of us uh, who, who live here in terms of the security precautions, in terms of the lockdown on what is otherwise a day in which the city is 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 just covered in foot traffic and other forms of traffic as people celebrate uh, the swearing in of of a president. And so we came to this work both with a sense of some new developments and some longstanding history. And we tried to have the experts, the professionals in government who study exactly those sorts of things, 
provide the baseline for our strategy and policy development. That's exactly where that threat assessment that you mentioned, Scott, fit in. The notion was that we wanted to build strategy and policy not on whatever preconceived notions we might bring to the issue, certainly not on any political views, but instead on the facts and on the best analysis of our government's career professionals, our experts. That is what they pulled together in that comprehensive assessment of the domestic terrorism threat as we face it today. They delivered it right on, on time to us at the White House on March 1. We released it in unclassified executive summary form with the help of our colleagues at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence just a couple weeks after that, so that not only those of us working on this issue, but ideally Congress and the public and researchers and the media could all start from something of the same baseline as to what this threat is that we were working so hard to develop a comprehensive strategy to address. So, so as you kind of alluded, this issue has been with us in one form or another, although in some ways through a variety of kind of permutations for, for several decades, arguably longer than that, but for at least several decades. And you have seen, we've all seen, several prior administrations take different approaches to it. You saw sometimes robust confrontation under Attorney General Janet Reno and the Clinton administration that was proved sometimes controversial. You saw a much more, at least some I've heard some folks in the media described as kind of a weighted out or a less confrontational approach in the Obama administration. You had the Trump administration with its own idiosyncratic, not always consistent takes across different parts of the government. What are the big lessons that you and your colleagues in the Biden administration have tried to take away from that about this pendulum swing or the different approaches, the strengths and weaknesses of them? And, and what, where is the Biden administration trying to land in terms of navigating those approaches? What are they taking and what are they trying to move away from in terms of striking the right balance? I would say in a nutshell that we wanted to make sure that we were reacting but neither underreacting nor overreacting. Both of those can be temptations, especially if one doesn't approach the threat the way you and I were just, just discussing, with a grounded sense of where it stands and where it's likely to go. We were given very clear guidance, truly from the highest levels, that as we approach this work, we both needed to address the urgency of the moment, address the fact that we were digging in just after January 6, but also in the wake of the past number of years, whereas the FBI director and others had been testifying, the numbers of deaths, the numbers of attacks associated with domestic terrorism had been rising, and at the same time, with a charge, a mandate to do all of this in a way that doesn't infringe on civil rights or civil liberties and actually promotes civil rights and civil liberties by reaffirming the rule of law. I mean, ultimately, that's what's at stake here. Domestic terrorism is a challenge to the notion that when those of us who are in a democracy are unhappy or displeased or frustrated or even angry about certain outcomes, outcomes in elections, outcomes in the policymaking process, outcomes in the legislative process, domestic terrorism says that violence is on the table as a response to that. But core democratic principles, of course, say the opposite, that whatever one's frustration or anger, one can't turn violent with political or ideological or social grievances. And so to do the work that we needed to do in understanding the threat better and building better analyses of it, including using the full suite of information out there to do so, in terms of engaging in prevention efforts, trying to stop people before they ever reach the stage of criminality or violence, in terms of dealing with those who do and using even creatively, innovatively, the, the tools in the toolbox of law enforcement, federal and otherwise, to disrupt activity when it reaches the point of criminality. And then over the long haul to get at the, the contributors to this problem, that all of that needed to be done in a way that affirmed that core principle, which is that countering domestic terrorism is fundamentally about reaffirming a core principle of our democracy, that we resolve our differences, whatever they may be, peacefully and not through violence. There's one just really striking line that I think highlighted a lot of the challenge that prior administrations, and no doubt you all as well, ha have encountered and are encountering around this issue. And that set the line was the IC's assessment that among the contributors that might exist to an increase in the likelihood or lethality of domestic violent extremist attacks in 2021 and beyond was the growing perceptions of government overreach. The idea that government enforcement efforts, government involvement might itself be a contributor to 
lean towards violence, the mobilization, the extremization, or the movement towards more extreme behavior on the part of at least some of these domestic actors. And when you think about the role that rhetoric around, you know, the right to bear arms and a sort of other issues plays in at least some of these groups' ideology and some of their their own public rhetoric and, and justificatory mechanisms, you can kind of see that a little bit about there is this sense of being under siege and that plays into their ability to justify their behaviors to their members. How do you strike the right balance? What is the right calibration of government engagement to avoid feeding into those narratives while nonetheless playing the role that the rest of society needs for the government to be an effective enforcer of the law and preventer of violence and the other negative outcomes that can come from those sorts of ideologies and those sorts of actions? Scott, I think the key to that is focus. We tried to be relentless, assiduous in the strategy, in how we've talked about the strategy since its release, that we are focused on violence and the threat of violence. People can talk about different things when they say they're talking about domestic terrorism. And for some people, they they characterize more widely. But for us, Avoiding both any reality or any perception, hopefully, of government overreach is driven, at least in significant part, by staying focused on violence or the threat of violence. There's a wide uh, array of of views held uh, in the United States on political and social and ideological issues, and and that's protected, that's encouraged, that's part of what makes uh, this country great. When those views, wherever they fall, on or off the political spectrum, get to the point of violence or threats of violence, that is when they become a threat to national security, become a threat to to public safety, become the kind of threat I was uh, talking about before, really to democratic integrity itself. And so our effort to ensure that all the pieces of the strategy, all of its implementation, both to this point and going forward, stay focused on violence and threat of violence is, to our mind, really key to avoiding that sense of of overreach and, and of course, avoiding overreach itself. I think it's also important to recognize then this strategy, as well as the, the threat assessment that was provided by the intelligence community and which we quite deliberately embedded in the strategy document to show how it served as the basis for it, both of those documents talk about how The spreading of disinformation, the spreading of conspiracy theories can be, in some instances, a gateway to violence. And I think that is part of the the problem that you're pointing to, which is it is often a perception, really a misperception of government overreach, fed by, fueled by disinformation if it's deliberate, misinformation if it's less deliberate, but nonetheless, not based in facts, not based in, in reality, but based on conspiracy theories and disinformation, much of which, so not all of which circulates online, that can lead to those misperceptions. And so as we acknowledge in the strategy, over the long haul, rolling back the threat Americans face from domestic terrorism requires restoring a healthier information environment in which there's a common set of facts, even if we then have a wide array of views and political opinions based on them. So the policy strategy that you all lay out is really centered on four pillars. It's kind of a familiar structure, I think, of a lot of government strategies we've seen in the last decade or two. But I think it's interesting because they're not necessarily the pillars, I think, at least not all of them, are the ones that you would anticipate going into this sorts of policy solution. And they reflect a different sort of perspective. And so I think it's worth running through them and pulling out some interesting elements of them. The first one, and I think this is actually one of the more interesting ones, is that you really make a point of emphasizing in the strategy the need to share information and improve the access and availability of information. And this is interesting because I don't think most people think of this domestic violence, extremism, domestic terrorism as being an issue where there's a lack of experience. Obviously, this is something happening in our own country. It's not foreign intelligence topic. It's not uh, something we have spies chasing after different parts of the world. But your strategy kind of makes the case that there actually are gaps in that information and that there's a need to try and expand and develop broader awareness and broader access to information about these sorts of issues. What are those blind stops? What are those gaps we have now that we need to fill? And what are you all proposing to do to try and fill them? I think that that part of the strategy starts from the premise that the domestic terrorism threat presents 
a persistent threat environment in which individuals or small groups of individuals can move from simmering hatred, bigotry, and cross that threshold to violence with little or even no warning to, to, to law enforcement of the type that makes it easier to, to disrupt and prevent that, that violence. Of course we know, and this was a major lesson post 9-11, of course we know that if there is some long developing elaborate plot that parts of the government become aware of, information about it should be shared with appropriate parts of the federal government and often non-federal partners to ensure awareness and, and disruption. But what we have found and what the experts and professionals who provided us with the threat assessment to inform the strategy development emphasize to us is that it is that is not often the form of plot, the form of threat that domestic terrorism is, is taking right now. Of course it can. Of course we always need to be aware and guarding against it. But often it is those individuals or small groups. So what does it mean to ensure that parts of the federal government and perhaps even more so our state, and local and territorial and tribal partners have the information they need to sensibly prioritize and allocate resources in that persistent threat environment that I was describing. And if the answer isn't going always to be some particular long running detected plot, it needs to be other things. It needs to be the types of locations, the types of dates, the types of gatherings, the types of events that might have symbolic value to these types of threat actors. That's a different sort of information provision. And it's one that I have seen the analysts in, in, a, in the federal government focus more on and improve on and share more widely and more speedily, even in the, in the, the months that I've been back serving in government. But that I think is part of what's distinctive about this information environment and about creating and then as importantly, perhaps even more importantly, sometimes sharing that understanding with those poised to act on it. Another interesting inclusion in that section that you pull out, which again is, is something that I don't think would necessarily be intuitive to a lot of people, is the importance of illustrating transnational ties to these domestic violent extremist elements, where they intersect with international, transnational organizations and actors that might share ideology or be relationships of convenience where nonetheless they are working towards some sort of common goal or providing some common support. And interestingly, it even expressly raises the possibility of exploring, applying different types of international terrorism authorities. Specifically, I think it references the foreign terrorist organization designations and special designated global terrorist designations that are associated with, among other things, international economic sanctions under IEPA or in the case of the FTOs, kind of criminal prosecution for material support for terrorism. Very familiar authorities, I think, to a lot of lawfare readers who have followed the international terrorism strategy for the last several years, talks about exploring the extent to which those might be applicable here. And this is a little bit interesting, uh, and also because it's something that hasn't been explored as much recently and it has been a little fraught when it has been in the past. If you think about the Islamic charity cases that happened after 9-11, which a case where a number of Islamic U.S.-based Islamic charities were designated as SDGTs, among other kind of AIPA-based designations, and challenged those in the courts. And the government generally won, but there were some places of pushback in the courts and a lot of domestic controversy around those designations, people saying this chilled practice in uh, Muslim communities, things like that, where at least there, in some camps, there's a perception that was a degree of overreach. How do you calibrate the ability to take those authorities and import them to this sort of problem based on these transnational ties? Is there a particular you know, risk assessment that needs to be taken in that, that layers on top of what you might intuit in, in terms of the international terrorism context? Or how are you all thinking about that assessment of to the extent to which that's available, that illustrating the transnational ties seems to be kind of a precursor for? So we start from this premise, that domestic terrorism, as, as the name suggests, is predominantly a domestic phenomenon, but that we need to understand it in a global or transnational context. And to do so, that means engaging with foreign partners in ways that we have not always prioritized, perhaps. And understandably, it's not unreasonable to avoid prioritizing asking a foreign partner about its own domestic threats, which 
might not seem to, to have a, a ton of significance for our national security. But now we realize that those can and sometimes do. And that's true in a, in a couple different senses. One is we, of course, want to know of any connectivity. Actors whom we are thinking of as predominantly domestic, if we find out they have connections to actors abroad, whether that's through travel or plotting or recruitment or financial flows, we, we of course, want to know about it. And indeed, it may prove that something that looked like a predominantly domestic phenomenon becomes more international or transnational in its orientation the more we understand it. But those connections are one thing that we want to know. The second is, even if they're not directly connected, we want to understand this as an evolving phenomenon and, and, more importantly, as an evolving threat. So that means that even actors domestic to other countries, but similar in their ideological orientation, similar in their recruitment, especially when they are recruiting online, as so many do quite quite heavily, as their memes, their themes, their, their imagery evolve, we may be able to recognize recruitment and, and radicalization efforts among our own domestic actors. We may be able to benefit from our partner's assessment of the trends and trajectories that we can then apply at home, even get ahead of the curve here at home. So at least in those two respects, the connections and the sense that this, is, that this phenomenon is unfolding in a global context makes us want to, and indeed we have, prioritized engagements with foreign partners specifically on this set of issues. Now, what that might yield, the information that may uh, come back from that, especially as it accrues over time, could unlock exactly some of the tools that you're talking about, Scott. And these are foreign-facing tools, foreign terrorist organization designation. As the name suggests, that's about foreign entities, especially designated global terrorists. In 2019, the Russian imperial movement and three of its leaders became the first entities of white supremacist orientation to, to be so designated under, under that authority. The more information we have, the more it may allow those in our system, especially the State Department, but also the Treasury Department and others who contribute to this work, to determine whether those foreign-facing tools, in fact, could appropriately be brought in to play for foreign-facing affiliates, foreign-facing actors, foreign-facing entities of, of similar ideological orientations. But the first step to determining whether there are ways to increase their use is to understand the phenomenon, understand global connectivity uh, among it, and to understand trends and trajectories that may well illuminate how this is evolving here in the United States. So the second pillar in your strategy is the prevent recruitment and mobilization pillar, a, a focus on you know, preventing the social practices and processes that lead people to join domestic violent extremist movements or engage in related activities. And I think it's fair to categorize a lot of what fits in this pillar as resembling or overlapping with what is often called CVE or countering violent extremism. The idea of kind of cutting off the resource base or addressing the drivers that move people in the direction of participating in these sorts of movements. And CVE has always been a real challenge. We've seen efforts at it that are substantially funded, uh, both by the United States, by lots of allied countries in the Al-Qaeda context, in the context of the Islamic State. And I think a lot of people who have looked back on those policies have queried how effective they've been, particularly around uh, some counter messaging and things like that. What is the the particular focus that you all envision? What are the priorities for preventing recruitment and mobilization in the domestic context? And, and how do those feed off those prior lessons of prior CVE efforts, if they do? Or do, how are, can, should they be distinguished from them? Well, what do, what do we think is going to work in this context, that even if it may or may not work in the international context and other contexts where we've undertaken similar endeavors? That's really important context that, that, that you're highlighting there, uh, Scott, because we do come at this prevention work trying, and I think succeeding, in internalizing the lessons learned from past prevention work. You know, the, the strategy document is, is pretty candid. It says that past government prevention efforts have had a mixed record, and we need to do better. That's the, those are the exact words from the strategy document. At the same time, as the document emphasizes, there is always a desire to stop individuals before they get to the point of violence, before they get to the point of criminality. That is better for protecting public safety. It's also better for those individuals if they can be pointed in a different direction before essentially they've broken laws and it's the law enforcement system that they have to, to deal with. So 
even if the track record here is mixed, the fundamental goal remains important. And I think here, what we have begun to do is draw on some of those experiences that, that you pointed to, Scott, to, to introduce an, an evolving and improving approach to prevention. One key feature of this is building things at the community level. I think what those who've succeeded in the past in this area tell the rest of us is that how to set up the right structures for these sorts of prevention efforts differs community to community and needs to be driven by the needs of a particular community, which means there is no cookie cutter for this. There is no one size fits all. Instead, what it requires is hard work out in the field, so to speak, understanding in a given community, whether it's educators, whether it's community leaders, whether it's mental health professionals, what the right network is that can help those in the community identify those who may be going down a pathway toward violence and offer them some, some alternatives. Another key piece that we emphasize in this strategy is prevention in the digital arena. All of us increasingly live our lives, partly, but, but significantly, online. And we need to for, for our jobs, for our, our, all sorts of things. But that also means that the online space is one where a range of hostile actors can attempt to take people down some routes that we really don't want to see them going. And that's true of domestic terrorist recruiters. It is, for that matter, true of those who pursue malign influence campaigns or those who seek election interference. What all of this means is that our national security can benefit if we can foster a more resilient, less vulnerable digital citizenry so that we are collectively more skeptical consumers of some of what we encounter online, that we engage with actors, with content online in a way less susceptible to recruitment, radicalization, or other harms, and ultimately m m more, more resilient. And so you see significant mention in, in the document of fostering digital literacy online fitness that can help with this. You also see significant mention in, in the document of trying to get at the source of some of this uh, material by stepping up our information sharing with key technology companies by addressing the challenges posed by some of the technology platforms in a global context through the recent uh, decision by, by the uh, Biden administration to join the Christchurch call to action to eliminate terrorist and violent extremist content online. So uh, th uh, those are just a, two key features, I think, of where we locate some of the prevention efforts called for in this strategy. Doing things at the granular community level, informed by stakeholders, and uh, addressing the internet and internet-enabled platforms as a key place where today's recruitment and incitement and mobilization to violence can occur. Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting. For creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast. For the stories. I'm glad you mentioned the digital arena because that's exactly where I want to drill down a little bit in this pillar because it is, again, one of these areas where because of the era you all are operating and developing the strategy really stands out as this is something a little new uh, or a different direction to be taking this set of issues. And of course, this is all happening against this backdrop of the discussion of the role these major tech companies like Facebook and Twitter play in shaping these dialogues, facilitating types of social interaction, types of communication, and the responsibility they play in that role, and how that intersects with the government, and how that intersects, of course, with First Amendment rights, political speech, the other types of constitutionally protected conduct that does take place online. There's a lot of confusion uh, and a lot of often misrepresentation, sometimes deliberate, sometimes not, about how these things overlap and interplay. But from the perspective of the authors of the strategy, what is the vision for the responsibility that these big tech companies are supposed to be playing in this sort of dialogue? And how does that interface with the government's own efforts 
certainly directly regulatory regulating speech. I think we all know encounters First Amendment issues, um, and anything that gets close to that is likely to be politically controversial, if not constitutionally problematic. But there is nonetheless a vision of some sort of relationship, it seems here. So so what is the right tenor of that relationship? And how should these two big social actors, you know, the government and these new tech companies that that handle so much of this, be interacting around this issue set? And my answer to that begins in some ways with with a good point you, you made before, Scott, about trying to learn lessons from past counterterrorism efforts, including where appropriate and transferable uh, international terrorism-focused efforts. And so here, I and, and some of the others who, who who are working on this go back to the work that we did in government in 2015 into 2016, when ISIS really began to emphasize more and more online recruitment and radicalization, began to pour increasing resources into a high pace of online output, in some ways slickly produced online output, all designed to encourage violence and bring additional fighters uh, at that point to Iraq and Syria, ultimately to other places in support of ISIS's cause. And as you say, with with healthy respect for, for free expression, the U.S. government nonetheless saw some real challenges to, to national security and to public safety arising from this sort of content sitting on the private sector platforms where it was being disseminated and distributed. And so a number of us worked cooperatively, voluntarily with tech companies to try to help them understand how we as the government saw some of these challenges and threats. How we saw, for example, activity that crossed platforms, which is not something that those at any one platform often spend a lot of time thinking about. We were able to share what top analysts, top experts within the government saw as the relationship between some of the online content and some of the physical world violence that it was designed to, to stoke and, and, uh, and yield, and in some cases did stoke and yield. And so that is the sort of analysis that people in government work really hard to do, but which those who work at tech companies may spend less time developing and thinking about. So in a number of ways, we felt we could inform, we could educate as to how we saw the role of internet-enabled platforms in propagating a very real terrorist threat so that companies could then consider how better to protect what are ultimately their own users, their own other users on their platforms, the users whom, whom terrorist recruiters are trying to move towards violence and criminality. So we opened a number of, of useful channels, I think, for government to provide information, to educate, again, so that voluntarily companies might consider how they enforce their own terms of service, or if they feel it appropriate, even update those terms of service. And our goal here has been to, to use that basic model to do something similar on these sets of threats, to educate, to inform, to articulate how we see and how experts within the government see the connection between some of what circulates and propagates online and threats in, in the physical world to public safety, potentially to, to, to national security even, to sh demonstrate how we see some cross-platform activity, to demonstrate tr and educate on trends and trajectories as, as those in government understand those. So we think that can help inform those in the tech sector in a pretty similar way to how the government tries to inform those, for example, in critical infrastructure fields about threats they may want to know about. Not necessarily mandating particular activity based on that, but because partnerships are key to addressing so many national security threats, and in particular, national security threats that can accrue on platforms owned and operated by the private sector. And at this point, social media and file upload sites and other internet-enabled platforms are one site where the domestic terrorism threat uh, evolves uh, and emerges. And so we think informing those who run those platforms about that threat can be a piece, but an important piece of addressing the threat. The third pillar of the strategy is really what I think a lot of people associate with counterterrorism when they think of it, uh, whether it's domestic or international. But here, obviously, speaking of the domestic, and that is disrupting and deterring terrorism, as you all describe it. This is what covers, uh, in particular in the domestic context, the range of law enforcement authorities really available to prevent acts of terrorism and to prosecute people who are involved with them, 
and the kind of spectrum of options there. And, and it's interesting because in, in some ways, this section is a little incomplete. I think it's it's fair to say, because uh, you all lay out that, in fact, you are a couple of ways to approach this problem within the line of existing authorities. Um, but then you note and acknowledge the Justice Department is still engaging a longer view about potential legislative reforms, changes in terms of law enforcement authorities or presumably other authorities as well that they feel are needed to do this job most effectively. I guess my question for you would be, as that review is still sort of ongoing, what is the tactical approach that, that you all have taken and are or, or at least laid out here? in regards to the existing authorities, the existing resources available to you? And then what can you share about the state of that review, the range of things it's looking at and how that fits into that picture or may change the terrain on which these agencies are operating moving forward once once it's completed and if Congress is amenable to the sorts of changes the Justice Department may end up requesting? I think we started with a real sense of urgency about this threat and therefore a sense of urgency in addressing it. And so as the the work we were doing evolved, as our conversations evolved, we, we settled on the imperative of having a strategy that could rise to the challenge of today. The challenge that not only is here today, but as I was mentioning earlier, had been all too palpable in Washington two weeks before, uh, before Inauguration Day and, and, and lingered very heavily in the air as, as many of us went to, to work uh, in government again for the first time on, on January 20. And so this strategy is entirely doable, is entirely implementable under existing law, under existing authorities. That, to our mind, rises to the urgency of the moment. At the same time, it felt premature to take off the table the possibility that as we do this work and as we continue to implement this strategy, to the extent gaps emerged, to the extent gaps crystallized in the view of especially Department of Justice leadership, it felt premature to take off the table a conversation about pursuing those. And so the strategy uh, does both. It ensures that we can act now in some of the ways that it articulates to use law enforcement as a piece of how we address this problem, including through greater prioritization of it in FBI field offices across the country and prioritization of it in U.S. attorneys' offices across the country and unprecedented case tracking through throughout that system, unprecedented collaboration on domestic terrorism investigations and prosecutions with the experts at Maine Justice here in Washington. So all of that could happen. And at the same time, Justice Department leadership could do what, what it indicated it wanted to do. They, like you, Scott, like me, we were all aware that there are strong passions in the debate about whether to pursue legislative change in this area, and if so, what it should look like. And uh, there's a desire to be data-driven, there's a desire to be considered, there's a desire, there's a desire to be careful before bringing forward any, any recommendation as to what legislative changes, if any, might be appropriate here. So in addition to acting now and acting in the ways the strategy lays out under existing authorities to rise to this threat, as you say, the strategy calls for the Justice Department to take that time to be careful, to take that time to be data-driven, and when it is ready to come forward with whatever recommendation or recommendations it might have for pursuing legislative change um, in this area. But I would just emphasize, we feel the urgency of, of this situation. And so there is so much that we can do and indeed are doing to address this threat right now. And, and, and just one more word on this, because it's so important. I mentioned some of what's being done by federal law enforcement in, in U.S. attorney's offices and FBI field offices. But I also want to emphasize that we take very seriously the need to be an enhanced and augmented partner to state, local, territorial, and tribal law enforcement in this area too. And the strategy talks about sharing not just some of the analytic information that you or I were discussing earlier, Scott, but also training and resources and indicators of mobilization of the type the federal government has provided for a while with respect to international terrorism, but now focused on domestic terrorism. So to step up as a partner to non-federal law enforcement, because they are often best placed to identify emerging domestic terrorism threats, like so many threats to public safety, and then to act against it. I'm so glad you raised that again, because that's, that's actually exactly what I want to drill down on in this particular pillar here, is this theme that is underlying, I think, so many aspects of this document um, and is such a unique aspect 
particularly even in the United States compared to other countries, but certainly unique comparing domestic to international terrorism, is this federalism question. Is how you approach domestic terrorism a policy challenge of which the criminal aspects of which are often acts of violence that generally we would assume would be regulated by the states, whether it's you know assault, murder, things like that, absent whatever the broader nexus that might make it a particular federal concern and may or may not qualify it for federal criminal regulation and legislation. And I felt like this section is really the area where you saw that tension begin to play out a little bit here and even a little bit in the next pillar, where it's acknowledged that uh, you really are reliant upon non-federal partners to some extent being good partners and actors on this. And you know something I think we've heard story of, particularly we had Leah Satilli, um, who's a wonderful journalist who's done a lot of work on the American Redoubt in Idaho and other parts of the kind of upper American West movement, the Redoubt movement there through her Bundyville podcast and associated writings. And a phenomenon that she kind of documents is often a degree of co-optation by local authorities, sometimes even statewide authorities to some degree, um, where there's a resistance to seeing what many would call extremist movement or certainly concerning activity, perhaps moving in that direction as seriously and take it and treat it as seriously as some might like to intervene early enough to prevent it from becoming something more serious. How is that problem envisioned in this sort of framework here? You you know, if the strategy really talks about providing resources and information to local partners and non-federal partners, but how do you overcome that uh, sort of resistance that may exist in certain areas where local authorities may not see the problem the same way or may have their own uh, reasons for resisting in implementing the law fully the way that the executive branch uh, and that the federal government thinks it needs to be enforced to address the terrorism threat. Are, are there authorities in play there or is there a question about the different role for how the FBI and other federal agencies will engage on those issues in those areas? How do you envision approaching that particular challenge? So my thinking, and, and more importantly, the, the the group's thinking, is informed by our work during the process of this review to really engage with those who hold these sorts of important, challenging roles and carry these responsibilities at the state and local level. And we engaged with the state attorneys general and 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 other st- states general counsel. We engage at the level of, of police chiefs and, and uh, intelligence units of, of police. We tried to hear where they felt they had gaps and where they felt that we as the federal government could be a better partner to them. And that's part of what informed uh, what you see in the, in the ultimate strategy document. They want information and intelligence on this. They want resources. They want training. And they want to understand how to identify these sorts of threats in their midst. And we think we can do and, and indeed are doing already a better job of, of, of providing that. But as you say, there's also a challenge about ensuring that no one is able to exploit or abuse sensitive positions or positions of trust for bad causes or to, to fail to live up to, to the values that we set out in this document, but that more importantly are the values that, that mean that domestic terrorist violence is simply unacceptable in our, in our democracy. And it's, at its most extreme, um, that's the challenge of uh, sometimes called the insider threat of, of individuals actually entering law enforcement or the military with an intent to abuse or exploit those roles or radicalizing while holding those roles. And the document takes seriously that piece of the challenge, too. And, and it says that not just at the federal level, where it articulates a number of steps we're taking to defend better against that threat, but also at the state, and local and tribal and territorial uh, level, we have plans to do better. And in particular there, we are planning to provide threat assessments so that our non-federal partners understand fully, even those who may not begin with the same understanding we do, the nature of this threat, including what it would mean to their own forces, to fellow officers, uh, if if this sort of um, infiltration were allowed to occur. We intend to provide uh, resources. We intend to provide training so that there can be an improved approach to ensuring that no positions of, of that nature can be abused or exploited. So that in some ways is the extreme of, of not sharing our view of what it means to serve in, in law enforcement and carry out the role that, the, that that position entails. But I think across the board, what we can do is we can help educate and engage. And of course, this strategy is a piece of, of saying at a, at a kind of comprehensive level level 
how we're approaching this. But our engagement with state and local partners will take and is taking many, many, many more and more granular forms. And sometimes that's law enforcement doing it through joint terrorism task forces, of which there are many, many across the country. Uh, sometimes that's Justice Department leadership doing it through the DTAC, the Domestic Terrorism uh, Executive Council. Sometimes it's uh, partners at the Department of Homeland Security uh, doing that sort of engagement. But in, in various forms, our goal is to keep sharing our understanding of this threat, keep hearing what our partners want back to address it, and keep refining the type of federal partner we can be. That takes us to the fourth and final pillar of the strategy, which again, I think is a really interesting point of inclusion. That, and that is what uh, you all have categorized as confronting long-term contributors. And it's it's interesting because it stands out from the other pillars in that it doesn't really have any specific strategic sub-goals, sub-bullets, nor even really clearly policy drive as articulated the same degree of uh, specificity of the other three pillars, but is really there acknowledging that this issue exists at the intersection of a lot of other bigger issues that would be too big to cover in a document that's of this scope and of this length, whether it ranges from racism, institutional racism, non-institutional racism, social racism, gun violence, effective local law enforcement, the relationship, federalism relationship, faith in government more generally. And I think the the question I have is, you know, why did you all think it was important to include this section in the strategy? What is the strategic benefit of nesting this particular set of policy challenges in this broader web of very complicated, often very controversial questions, where I think many would agree that it intersects, but there's often disagreement about how exactly it should or how exactly it does. And perhaps more importantly, how does that relate to what I assume is a broader goal about taking this particular policy agenda and making it something that's politically durable, really laying it out as a strategy of something that's not just for the Biden administration, but selling it, saying this is something that as a country we need to move towards, which is a kind of underlying theme, I think, of of the strategy as a whole, Republican and Democrat, no matter where you're on the political spectrum. What role does this last section, this last pillar really play in the overall strategy? And how does that fit with the more concrete priorities that it lays out? I love the way you asked that question, Scott, because I, I think in some ways it, uh, it kindly anticipates the answer, which is perhaps the most critical step we could take with this portion of the document was to show the interconnectivity of it all, to show that even as we are addressing a threat that you hear me keep describing in this conversation as, as urgent and palpable and here, we are also committed to approaching this work in a way that diminishes that threat over the long haul. And that's something that takes addressing those longer term contributors, those longer term uh, elements and factors in this threat. And so it is true that th this is work that is in some ways broader than just countering domestic terrorism as it might be traditionally conceived, tackling racism, addressing gun violence and mass murders, providing early inter intervention and care for those who, who, who face the sort of challenges that may lead them to pose a danger to themselves and to others. Those are broader, but they are central to, they are meaningful contributors to, drivers even, of today's domestic terrorism threat as we face it. So we'd be remiss if we left them out. And moreover, they are what will shape how the trajectory of this threat evolves over the future. In some ways, this takes us back to earlier in the conversation as we talked about historical context and we talked about how Today's domestic terrorism threat has some very new elements, including technologically driven ones, and has some very old elements, like the targeting of, of certain communities quite deliberately based on ideologies that are all about targeting certain communities. And so where that history goes into the future, as the future becomes history, we think is affected by how these longer term factors are addressed. So the, the Biden administration has had already quite a bit to say about what the federal government can do on racism, for example, in an executive order. It's had quite a bit to say about what government can do about gun violence and mass murders through some of the firearms work that's been articulated by White House leadership, by Justice Department leadership, and it will have more to say on these issues. But these are issues that we felt are so bound up with domestic terrorism as we face it today and as we will see it evolve in the future that we needed to reflect their connectivity in, in this document. And that's, that's what we've done. 
One last question for you, Josh, before I let you go for the evening. You know, this document obviously captures a moment for the Biden administration, for the United States kind of writ large. A uh, hundred days into a new administration, uh, tackling an issue that I think everyone acknowledges has been kind of operating in the immediate background of uh, everything the Biden administration has been tackling during its first few months in office. And that in a lot of ways the country has been dealing with for, for the last several years, and most acutely in the in just the last few years. What is the metric that you are planning to evaluate, I suppose, yourselves on uh, in terms of executing the strategy uh, and that you think the United States should be holding itself accountable to. I think we all acknowledge that this is a problem that is real enough, substantial enough, and better enough that we probably can't expect there not to be incidents of violence again in the near future, potentially substantial ones. But what are we, should we be looking at as citizens, as voters, or as policymakers like yourself, to say, we are headed in the right direction on this issue, we are taking the right steps, and we're seeing the results we need under the strategy. And what should we be looking for if we just say, this strategy isn't working, we need to find a different tack? So I have answers on a couple different levels to that that terrific and, and important question. And at the most basic level, of course, this work is about protecting lives, protecting those who, who live in this country from those who would turn to violence with their political or ideological or social grievances. And to the extent we see certainly fatalities go down, but injuries and and even attacks in the name of, of domestic terrorism go down, of course, we're looking to do that. A, at the same time, and here's where I shift to sort of a, a different level for, for a different piece of the answer, there's something that can't be reduced to, to sheer numbers, that can't be reduced to the number of attacks or even the number of of injuries or, or tragic deaths associated with them, which is the notion that violence is is on the table, is in play for those who are politically or otherwise uh, aggrieved. And at, at a higher level of generality, beyond the, the numbers of, of attacks or, or, or casualties, what this strategy aims to do, what I think it can guide us in doing, is shifting away from that that creep we've seen over the past couple of years, as the numbers have gone up with respect to domestic terrorism attacks and fatalities, but the broader sense for still a very, very small portion of this, uh, of this country, but the turning to violence uh, is, is somehow on the table when, when there's unhappiness or displeasure with an election result or, or some political outcome. And so ultimately, even as a strategy like this is about public safety, national security, and saving lives, it's also about national security in that sense of, of, of reaffirming democratic integrity, of reaffirming the notion that when we operate as a democracy under the rule of law, we're allowed to be unhappy, even angry, but violence is off the table. And uh, restoring that, reaffirming that commitment to resolving our differences peacefully that, I think, is a big piece of what this strategy aims to accomplish. Well, we will have to leave the conversation there. Josh Gelter, thank you for joining us today on the Lawfare Podcast. Thank you, Scott. Grateful for the chance to be with you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please take a moment to rate and review the Lawfare Podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you might be listening. Also, to gain access to an ad-free version of our podcast and other benefits, consider supporting Lawfare on our Patreon account at www.patreon.com lawfare. This podcast was engineered by Ian Enright of Goad Rodeo and edited by Jen Pacha Howell. Our music was performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening. Acast powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hi there, I'm Kendra Adachi, and I'm the host of the Lazy Genius Podcast, a weekly show helping you be a genius about the things that matter and lazy about the things that don't. Everything can't matter, right? Otherwise, you turn into a robot trying to do it all. So why not name what matters to you? And I'd love to help. New episodes drop every Monday morning, but there's a back catalog of over 200 episodes 
that will help you create systems and soul and everything from how you do laundry and how you cook chicken to how you navigate making new friends and even having tough family conversations. Embrace what matters, ditch what doesn't, and get stuff done with the Lazy Genius Podcast. A cash recommends.